Reverend Edward Pinckney. Mm. Now I have to introduce Reverend Pinckney as the person who has led courageously the movement in Benton Harbor, Michigan against the most horrendous uh, uh, theft of the land and of the beauty and um, of the facilities of the people of Benton Harbor in a profoundly racist, uh, against a profoundly racist attack. So uh, he landed in prison, as most prisoners do, because he was innocent. You know, that in this country is usually a crime, because the guilty are all in charge, you see. So I want to begin with Brother Pinkman. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, like she said, my name is Reverend Edward Pinckney. I'm the first pastor in the history of mankind that had ever been sent to prison for writing a scripture in a newspaper. And the judge said it was a threat on his life. But what I want to talk about, I want to show how we, how when you organize, that you don't try to separate people. That's how they beat us down. Any time that you're dealing with people themselves, they're always trying to find something to separate us. They try to separate us by race, uh, your genity, uh, whatever it is, they try to separate you. Class, they try to separate you. But one of the things that I did when I was inside the prison system, um, when I first got there, they knew I was coming. Everybody knew I was coming. And um, when I got there, I ran into these Muslim brothers. And they wanted me, they wanted to know what I was going to do to help them. And I couldn't figure out what I could do to help you. I just got here. And this guy was about six foot five, so I couldn't <laughs> turn him down. So I told him, let me think about it. So the very next day, I came up with this idea that uh, what I was going to do, I was going to organize the people on something that we all have in common, and that's the food. <laughs> they had the idea, they had this fish called the buck naked fish, and it was about as naked as you can get. <laughs> it was the nastiest fish, the smelliest fish that you have ever seen. So I use that as a tool to bring all the people together. So the first thing I did, I got the Muslim brothers. Then I went out and got the Aryan Nation brothers. Now, this Aryan Nation guy, he has been, he'd been in prison for eight years, but he had never spoken to a black person. So they told me, he's not gonna talk to you. I said, well, I'll make him an offer. <laughs> that he can't refuse. <laughs> so what happened, I walked up to him and I asked him, could I speak to him for a moment? And the first thing that came out of his mouth was that I don't speak, I don't talk to black folks. I don't talk to black people. And I say, well, I understand that, but we got a problem. And we need to work this problem out. So after I talked to him for a minute, I told him it wasn't important that you like me. See, that was the key word. You, we can work together, but we don't really have to like each other, as long as we have the same goals in mind. And that's how they separate us, by making say, well, you black, I'm white, and you, you know, you shouldn't be together. So this Aryan brother, I walked with him. Around you, when you're in prison, you walk around the yard. And I probably put in about five miles with this Aryan Nation guy. And everybody saw it. Everybody saw this black guy walking with this Aryan Nation guy who haven't spoken to a black guy since he'd been in prison. So what I did, I asked him. I said, look, I need your help. And I'm also here to help you. So he said, I told him that I had a plan. But I need it because he was the second largest group there other than the Muslim brothers. And I told him I needed his help. So what he told me 
He said, you know I don't talk to black people. I said, yeah, I understand that. But we got, a big, we got something in common here. We got a problem. And we trying to neutralize this prison. So after we talked for a little while, we, we went on. He said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go talk to my people about you. And if they say yay, it's a deal. So he went over there and talked to all his people. He came back and said, well, Reverend, I'm going to work with you. He said, because you're the only black person that ever came up to me and said, it's not important whether you like me or not. I care less about him liking me. We had a problem and I had to work with it. Then I went to the skinheads. I got them to work with us. <laughs> then I went to the Mexicans and the Puerto Ricans. I went to the Catholics. I went to the Baptists. Now when I went to the Baptist folks, they gave me the hardest tack. <laughs> <laughs> they told me that we're going to have to go pray about this. <laughs> and usually when they say they're going to have to go pray about something, they don't want to be, they're not going to do it. Because you always hear these preachers talking about, they, uh, uh, I'm going to go pray, uh, let me pray about it. Anytime they tell you that, it's not going to happen. But my main objective was to bring everybody together. I didn't care how I did it, but it had to be done. Because we had to stop this prison system from continuing beating up on people. They was beating people up. They, was, uh, they wouldn't even give us toilet tissue. You know, and I had to have some toilet tissue. So I, I knew that we had, we had a major problem. So after I got the, uh, the, the, the Christian brothers, because I told them either they're going to be with us or against us. And if you're not with us, we're going to roll right over you. And they knew that right that time, by me having the, uh, the Muslim <laughs> brothers and the Aryan Nation brothers, they knew that they better come along. Because right that time, we had over 800 people. There was 1,400 people inside the prison. But my goal was to have over 1,000. And that way we can stop. So let me get to the point because we only got eight minutes. So here's where I did what I did. We came up with the idea about this buck naked fish. And they only cooked 100 pieces of the buck naked fish. Only 100 pieces. And I figured that would be the tool to bring all these folks together. Over a thousand people joined us. Everybody went into the cafeteria and asked for the buck naked fish. <laughs> Everybody, they ran out after the first unit. They was mad. They knew something had to happen. They said, who can organize these folks like this? And they, they, they were wondering who could do this, because it couldn't have been me, because I only been there about four days. So it couldn't have been Reverend Pinckney. So they, they, you know, they, they look and they're trying to figure out what was going on. They had to warn everybody there, because this has never happened before. So now what they're saying now, here's the, the killer part. When I was, I was the last one to come in, because you know me, I probably was in the law library. So I, I leave the law library, we goes in there, and the signal was, once I drink my, 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 my soda, that everybody gets up at the same identical time. Can you imagine the fear on those folks when they see, you, you're seeing a thousand people get up at one time and taking their food and dumping it in the garbage? They knew there was something, this was something big. They were so nervous. They had surrounded the whole complex now because they was nervous. They didn't know what was going on. So what they did, they called all the leaders in. Not me. I wasn't the leader. So anyway, they called everybody in. And what they did, they told them they wanted to know what they wanted. They're willing to give them anything they want. But the word was, you don't want nothing. Because that one, they couldn't, you know, because you, you can do something one time, then they can knock you down, knock all the leaders down. That's what they do. They would have all of them been behind bars somewhere else and separate. So I told them, don't ask for anything. Tell them you don't know nothing about this. So the next time they came, they cooked 800 pieces of the buck naked fish. <laughs> so, they, so they said, we're going to outsmart them because when you're in jail, they don't look at you as being a very intelligent person. So they figured that they was twice as smart as we were, so they cooked the 800 pieces of fish. And they all sat down there. They know how smart us now, right? They know everything that's going on. So we didn't let nobody know nothing until that Friday. Friday night at midnight, we passed the word. Nobody goes to the cafeteria. And they had all that fish there. Now they, and they were so mad, I was on the phone. I was talking to my wife. And they came in, with these guards came in, about eight of them. And they said, Pinkney, we got an emergency. You out of here. So I'm thinking, I said, well, you know, I said, why, why? You know, I know when the emergency, I'm talking to my wife. 
But the thing was, what made this so important, never in the history of the Michigan penal system have ever, anybody ever got that many people together. Because normally you can get 200 of folks together, but you'll never get 1,000 people. But here's why I'm saying this. This is something that we are going to have to learn to do. We are going to have to learn to work together and support these people that's in prison. Because without that, they never would have. They never would have allowed me to get away. And at that time, I was also running for U.S. representative for, for, the, for the House. So the media was there and probably saved my butt. But they didn't figure it out with me, but somebody probably tell them. But I want people to know here today, we have to learn to work together. And we got to go out here and protect these guys that's in prison. You know, there's no picnic being in there. You know, if once you do your time, you deserve the right to be out here. Right on. And that's what we want to do. Okay. And on that note, I got to end because the time has ran out. But remember, the buck naked fish. <laughs> Take that with you. <laughs> Let Reverend Pinkney go on because I didn't think I had the right to stop that story. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. And we want to know a lot more about your tactics and strategy because that's what we need to know. Absolutely. Right. Well, the new Jim Crow mm -hmm. and kind of how that in some ways is a, a remarkable instance of something happening in some ways in broad daylight and actually invisible at the same time. I mean also on, on the Jim Crow, you know, to me what is so amazing about the book itself is written by a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And really the lawyers are some of the problems that exist oh, yes, that's it. in this country. I, I know like in yeah, Benton, but she's a black woman, Lord. yeah, and that makes it. But different. some of them, yeah, but they, some of them have issues too. Mm -hmm. But Absolutely. we have a couple of old lawyers down in in the city of Benton Harbor that I, that just so happen to be black, facially, and they're not really black. But the what I what I really got out of the book more than anything else that she was a lawyer and she was actually saying the things that we all should be saying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's to me is important. And but before I go on to see, and this is what we have to do too. We have to learn to work together. We have to forget about you know race. We have to eliminate that. We know racism exists. Let's move on. We have to find the right formula so we all can work together. Right. And then we can defeat this monster. That's what it is. It's a monster. Okay. But we have to learn to work together. Well, can I, uh, before I call, just, I want to mention two no, things. I must take up what the brother has said. Uh, the first thing is working together. Mm -hmm. I, the Georgia strikers, I mentioned this last mm -hmm. night, the Georgia strikers who refused to leave their cells to work for free, the whole, all the prisons in Georgia did that. Most of those strikers were, of course, black men, mm -hmm. but you could not find the word racism mm -hmm. in the material they put out because mm -hmm. they understand together. race That's right. and they understood that if they wanted the white prisoners to come out with them and the prisoners who are people of color but not black, they had to eliminate the word race from that thing. Mm -hmm. That is just what this brother is speaking about. They understood race and they understood the power that black people have accumulated over the years by great struggle and they knew how to get it together. Mm -hmm. So when they came out on strike they could say all of us are That's coming right. out. That's right. That's you right. see, that didn't mean they were going to forget about racism, you know. Mm -mm. They had a platform to deal with racism now. They had the power of a universal strike to deal with it. And I think that's this uh, identity politics that some of these careerists have played around with so that they get the job. They're not interested in ending racism. They're interested in their own careers and we have to be much more flexible about the way we handle sex, race, uh, indigenous, 
um, this ability, whether we're criminal or not, we have to be more sophisticated in order to make the connection, draw out the connections among us and have the power of that unity. I do appreciate what Edward has been saying. I want to make one other point, and that is, it's very, very true what the brother has said about lawyers. And I want to say that this identity politics has meshed with the careerism of individuals, the ambition, the individual ambition, so that there is a whole structure that guarantees mm. illegality mm. in the courts, in the society, among NGOs, even in support networks. Yes. That's why I trust Teresa. Mm -hmm. Her stake in it is her father. Mm -hmm. She's not going to crap out for a good job, you That's know. Right. That's but right. a lot of people are and are making money mm -hmm. off support just like they make any industry. The prison industrial complex is an industry that has been built on the need of the state for repression. Mm. Tell them about your we cream have to make crop. pardon your cream of the crop. You you just say that in a minute. <laughs> but I do want to say, you see, we have to get it right about the mm. prison industrial complex. Right. Yeah. It is an industry, mm. but it didn't start as an industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is a form of American concentration camp yeah. and that's what the industry was built on but it's the concentration camp which was the first priority and they used all the careerists and scabs and right-wing pigs against us. Mm. So those who talk like us almost and those who talk against us came together against us by crapping out at particular moments on behalf of their individual careers, and we have to stop that. That's right. That's okay. it. Hey, I, that's yeah. right. Yeah. You, you know, they would like toilet tissue. It's something that you should have. You know, if they ran out of toilet tissue, you don't have. Yeah. You're on your own. Whatever you can use. So what we did, you know, the day they came and got me, I also gave them the list because I had already anticipated that they was going to get rid of me sooner or later. So we gave them a list of demands, and the most important thing, they got toilet tissue now, they got soap, they got, uh, uh, and no longer serve the buck naked fish. That's crucial. Mm -hmm. And it's, it shows what you can do if you can work together. Right. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, like, white people don't want to work with black people, black people don't want to work with that, Mexicans don't want to work with the Puerto Ricans. I brought them all together to tell them, hey, we're all in this together. And we have to learn to fight together out here. Stop all this separation. That's how they defeat us. Divide and conquer. That's why we're in such a compromising position today. We have no reason. It's more of us. And here's a, I'm going to say this. I, I, I'm going I'm to cut off. The 99%. We got some people in the 99% trying to protect the 1%. And we have. That's the problem. Yes, we have. That's the problem. Defending the police. Absolutely. Yeah. You, and then you, these, these uh, we act like commissioners who's not even close to being part of the 1%, trying to protect them and with their life. Mm -hmm. They have to be yeah. exposed. Yeah, so that's what I do. I expose my brother meeting every, every, and they don't want to hear what I got to say. <laughs> You'll say it anyway. That's right. <laughs> A lot of people will defend you saying it. Mm in Benton Harbor, Michigan, May 23rd through the 27th, we're gonna occupy the PGA, the wow. senior PGA. Okay. And we want people to come. We're expecting a lot of folks to be there. Oh, this and is I'm expecting fantastic. each and every one of you to come, because this is so tremendous. Benton Harbor is the only city in the whole United States that actually have a dictator. That's right. He's a bona fide dictator, mm. yeah. absolute power. He fired the mayor, and he fired all the commissioners. Oh my God. Took his desk and put it in the basement, the mayor. Mm. But on that note, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Yeah. But I just want to say, occupy the PGA. That's the goal. I'm going to talk about the uh, 
in our next one what is about the uh, Professional Golf Association. Yeah. Yeah. Professional what? Golf, golf. golf. Association. Golf. Yeah, that the, 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 the golfers have yeah. taken the, the, the land and the beautiful oh, land yeah. Yeah. off, yeah. off, off the lake to course. call themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. stole the, wow. the whole yeah. damn thing and making millions. Right. And in memory of George Carlin, who <laughs> really yeah. knew what golf courses were all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you, you always railed against golf and yeah. golf courses and what a waste they were. Yeah. And take the water from yeah. the people in many places. Yeah. So yeah. occupy, yeah. occupy, occupy the PGA. Yeah. May 23rd through the 27th. Okay. Be there.